Hi, my name is Jeff Keenan, and I'm a professor of OBGYN at the University of Tennessee Medical Center here in Knoxville. I've been a member of CMDA for about 30 years, and it just had such a, a wonderful impact, not only on my professional life, but on my uh, personal life. For starters, Dave Stevens helped us form the National Embryo Donation Center, which in the field of uh, reproductive endocrinology has become a, a widely recognized and, and well-respected entity at a time when life is not always given the reverence that uh, deserves. Also, the grounding that just comes with being involved with other Christian healthcare professionals, I think helps me to avoid burnout, set the right priorities, and as a result, really thrive at the office and at home. I just love the emphasis they place on your practice being not just a practice, but a ministry uh, is really so helpful in that regard. I'm also uh, so thankful to CMD for the crucial role they play in the national health care debate. In addition, I believe uh, from my experience in our own local CMDA chapter that our students, who really are the future of medicine, are encouraged and are learning valuable insights from our more senior members. And I don't think I should forget to mention the benefit that CMDA has all over the world through their medical mission trips and their various international affiliations. So please join me in keeping CMDA in your prayers and continued support. CMDA matters to all of us. Hi, this is Pastor Burt Jones, and you're listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. I know that I'm not the voice that you're used to hearing on the podcast each week. Dr. Mike Chupp is traveling internationally this month, so I'll be filling in for him over the next few weeks. Before we jump in today's episode, we owe a big thank you to many of you who have been responding to help claim the $320,000 matching gift to help us reach our $827,000 fiscal year-end giving goal by June 30th. While the responses have been encouraging, I understand we still have a way to go. If you've been delaying your response, we would be grateful if you would take a few minutes to consider your gift today. To give, visit cmda.org slash match or call our stewardship team at 888-230-2637. The testimony you heard at the beginning of the podcast was from Dr. Jeff Keenan, who is the president of the National Embryo Donation Center, which is focused on protecting the lives and dignity of human embryos. Nearly 1,200 babies have been born through their incredible work. Fittingly, our episode today features another person focused on defending the rights of preborn children. Lila Rose is a writer, speaker, and activist. Lila founded and serves as president of Live Action, a human rights nonprofit with the largest digital footprint for the global pro life movement. Lila's investigative reporting on the abortion industry has been featured in most major news outlets, including the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, CBS, and ABC Nightline. Lila is the author of Fighting for Life, Becoming a Force for Change in a Wounded World. Plus, she is the host of The Lila Rose Show, a podcast that tackles relationships, faith, culture, and politics. Lila speaks internationally on family and cultural issues and she has addressed members of European Parliament and spoken at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Several weeks ago, she was one of the plenary speakers at the 2022 CMDA National Convention. Hearing her talk at the convention was incredibly powerful, and we wanted to give you an opportunity to hear it. So let's listen in as Lila shares with us. The core lesson of the culture of death versus the culture of life is this, that when people learn, they can change. And I'm going to be returning to this over the next uh, moments I have with you this evening. When people learn, they change. This is the secret of live action's work. This is the secret of the pro-life movement. This is the truth of our faith as Christians, that when we learn, when we're convicted of our own sin and of our own need, when we see the beauty and the gift of life, 
the life that eternally Christ wants to offer us and the life of the, of the child, when people learn, they change. And I believe that our job in this room tonight is to allow ourselves to be encouraged and changed in that way, to be even more inspired, to go out there and build the culture of life that's so desperately needed. I mentioned that I'm from California. I love my state. But I want to begin by talking about some of the threats that we are facing. I was just this morning filming a video for our millions of followers at Live Action. We represent over 5 million people online that we're getting the pro-life message out to regularly, mostly Gen Z and millennials, mostly younger women. And I was filming a video about the latest legislation in my crazy but beloved state. And some of you might have heard of this legislation, which is now about to enter its third committee and then will go to be voted upon, and it's likely to be signed into law. And you could call it the infanticide bill. This law would decriminalize the, any action taken by a medical professional or by a mother that regards neglect of a child during the, not just abortion, permitting abortion, et cetera, but during the perinatal period. So the law specifically calls out the perinatal period, which as you know, can mean 28 days after birth, both before and after birth, but it can mean 28, up to 28 days after birth. So that if you find a baby, if a baby were to be found, say, in a dumpster in the state of California, within that window of being newborn, just born, no foul play could be even suspected. And in fact, it penalizes police and, and those that are supposed to investigate homicide for even beginning to look into a case, a potential homicide case of a child that might have been killed within the first 28 days of death. Of course, the pro-abortion side in California is enthralled. The governor of my state, Governor Gavin Newsom, has said that he wants to make California the sanctuary state for abortion. You might have heard this. They want to actually pay for women to come to California to have abortions. And this is all happening because the extremism is incredibly intense right now, in part because we're about to have a Supreme Court decision in just the next couple of months which is very likely going to strike a huge blow to Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton. The companion, yes, we can clap for that. But California's not alone. Maryland also tried to pass this a law very similarly, also decriminalizing neglect or failure to act in the perinatal period. So a child could be left to die, or a child who is a, failed, a victim of a failed abortion could be left to die, and there would, could be no action taken for their death. Thankfully, because of the outcry of pro-life citizens, Maryland removed that language from their very pro-abortion law, but their law is still very pro-abortion, per abortion permitted through all nine months in the state of Maryland. These attacks are coming faster and faster. The last month, Live Action has been working on a campaign called Justice for the Five. Has anybody seen this campaign or heard of it? The story of the five infants in Washington, D.C. So brave pro-life activists that Live Action works with, and we do investigative reporting, we work with activist groups across the country, uh, we're boots on the ground as well as on the screen to explain what's happening and inspire people to take action. And we sent our film crew to DC about a month ago when activists alerted us privately saying that they had come into the possession of the remains of 115 aborted children that were on their way to be burned into energy by this company called Curtis Bay in Maryland. They were gonna be burned into renewable energy to light up the neighborhoods of Baltimore. This is, by the way, technically against the, the, the laws, uh, the regulations, but this is what they were going to do with these bodies. They were being loaded onto a Curtis Bay waste truck when these brave pro-life activists who were outside the abortion clinic in Washington, D.C., the Sergi Center, it's called, of Dr. Cesare Santangelo, said, can we, have the, can we have this box? And he said, what, are we, what do you want to do with it, the driver? And they said, we want to give them a proper burial, because they knew that this box was filled with the remains of children. And the driver said, take it. When they opened that box, they discovered not only 110 bodies of first trimester babies who'd been killed, but five bodies of babies who are nearly full term. Now when people say in the state of California, or in Maryland, or in national discourse on abortion, oh, late term abortions never happen. Or if they do, it's only because the baby's basically already dead, or it's, it's, a, it's a myth that pro-life people use to try to scare people. 
take a look at the images of these children. What our film crew documented, uh, for me, I've been in this movement again since as, as I've been a teen. I have been undercover in abortion clinics. I've sent teams undercover. I've been reporting on this for over a decade. And my heart was broken all over again just to look at the findings of these activists. Five children, one little boy nearly full term. He reminded me of my son that had just been born five months ago. He looked like he was a perfectly healthy, beautiful child who possibly, I think, because we've investigated this abortion clinic before and we have on undercover camera this abortionist admitting that he would leave a child born alive in his clinic to die. So admitting to infanticide. And this baby boy looks like he had not been cut or uh, injected with a feticide or anything. He looked completely intact. He was likely born alive. A dozen medical experts that Live Action works with reviewed the documentation and said it's very likely he was born alive, likely dumped in a bucket unceremoniously of some sort of solution to drown him. Another beautiful little girl, medical experts estimate about 30 weeks old, her neck had been cut deeply lacerated, her brain removed. As many of you may know, this would have been an illegal, there's a federal ban on this kind of abortion. It's called a DNX abortion, a partial birth abortion. There's a federal partial birth abortion ban act. And yet it appears that this abortionist, who by the way, lost his license for delivering babies because of all the malpractice, and now he kills babies, Santangelo. And he does it with complete protection from the authorities in DC. They don't even look over their shoulder twice at him. He's allowed to continue these barbarous acts against infants. The three other children, all of them could have been viable, two of them fully dismembered. Because it's unlikely that he uses a feticide, these children were likely dismembered while they were alive. It can be uh, almost overwhelming to consider that kind of violence. But to add to that horror, when the police, the homo DC homicide unit came to pick up the bodies because the pro-life activists working with their attorney said, please, these may be evidence of infanticide, the partial birth abortion ban act being violated. Here are the bodies, Here's, do an investigation. The very next day, the homicide unit shows up, picks up the bodies. The next day, there's a press conference. The Washington Post is there, all the major news groups. And the police say, these were legal abortions. And the question was asked, well, was an autopsy performed? And they said, no. No investigation was done. It was assumed these were legal abortions simply because abortion is legal through all nine months and they will look the other way. So that is what we are dealing with. Since that time, we've had several dozen Congress members, senators, representatives, urge Mayor Bowser in DC to take action. There have been in, uh, inquiries done to the Department of Justice. Action has been taken, but because the politics are so pro-abortion and those that are in power in DC and in power federally are so pro-abortion, justice is not here yet for those five children or for any of those 115 children or for any of the 2,363 children every single day who are killed by abortion in America. The leading cause of death for a child is abortion. The leading cause of death period in this country is not COVID, it's abortion. It beats out heart disease and cancer, accidents, abortion. Globally, abortion. It's why I've dedicated my life to this cause. It's why when I first learned these statistics as a teenager and I first understood and began to see we are killing our most vulnerable, set up in doctor-like offices in these sterile buildings where we send in our women who are pregnant who should be celebrated and encouraged and supported and we send them to practice choice, saying this is your empowerment to go and do this. This is you exercising your right. Enjoy your feminism, have your abortion when it's devastating to women and the brave women I've spoken with and we've interviewed over the years and friends of mine who've spoken out about their past abortion experiences, the devastation that they experience, the devastation for fathers that fathers experience. It's the devastation of a culture of death, a culture that sees life not as a blessing but a burden, that sees motherhood not as a gift but some kind of a curse that rejects those most intimate bonds of love, family love between a mother and her child, between a father and his child, that re rejects those bonds and turns them into violence, makes the safest place in the world, the place that should be the safest, a war zone. 
There's a story of a little boy. It's a, it's a um, cartoon that was created recently by a, an artist telling the story that, of a conversation of, that he might have been having with his son, a little boy saying, why are babies born in, or created in their mother? Why are they in their mother for nine months before being born? Why did God do it that way? It's a good question. Why did he do it that way? And the little boy suddenly remarks, because they're the safest there. Because they're the safest there. And yet that's the most dangerous place for a child in the world is the womb. How do we get here? A culture of death, an ideology that says life is cheap. Life and suffering isn't worth it. Sacrifice isn't worth it. That our convenience, our bodily autonomy trumps the rights of anybody else even to exist. A child's right to life is subservient to my convenience or to my sense of autonomy or to my future, whatever future career goals I have. That a human being's life is less than those things. And they don't even have a right to live. And yet we know, because our country was founded on this principle. The whole reason we have the country we have and the freedoms that we enjoy is because it was founded on certain fundamental human rights. Right? I mean, that's why we, are, we have the freedom of speech, that's why we have the freedom of assembly, that's why we have the freedom to live in this country without fear of being killed, without any protection uh, for us. But the child doesn't enjoy that today. We're not being true to those fundamental human rights. The first right is what? Life. Our Declaration of Independence, we are endowed by our creator. So our founders knew there was a God, that there was an absolute truth, there's an absolute moral authority bigger than us, and that the first human right is life. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but life comes first. You can't enjoy any other rights without life. But the culture of death sees life as cheap and so rejects that first human right. And there have been a lot of concerns about you know, freedoms in this country, there's been, in the last two years, I think our, our culture has been tried and shaken in so many ways with the pandemic, with so much social unrest, and we wonder, things are so divided, people are so angry, there's so much hurt. But these, this brokenness began decades ago. It's now coming to the surface. And I would rather it be on the surface than buried underneath, because at least on the surface we're forced to deal with it. We're first to, forced to deal with the ideological divide that has been creeping into our country now for decades. And that ideological divide is the culture of life versus the culture of death. It's the, those two competing views of the human person. The human person is made in God's image, endowed with human rights that are never to be violated from womb to tomb, or the human person that does as it pleases, decides its own morality, that the, the, the strong get to triumph over the weak, if you're bigger and stronger, then it doesn't matter about the one that's weaker and smaller. That, of course, is the pro-abortion ideology. Because I'm stronger than that child and because that child's dependent on me, therefore I can take that child's life. There's one other important aspect of the culture of death that we should be aware of, especially the medical professionals in this room should be aware of, and some of you may know this. But it's this, late-term abortion is this extreme that's happening. It is happening. Thousands, tens of thousands of times at minimum a year in this country, it's happening. Infanticide is happening. We've had undercover crews in abortion clinics and admissions from some of our most notorious late-term abortionists in this country saying that yes, babies are born alive and they're left to die. It is happening. Infanticide is already here. And some states are now boldly trying to even legalize it. But the other side is more and more abortions happening in homes in dorm rooms, in dorm bathrooms, the abortion pill. A few years ago, the abortion pill was about a third of abortions in this country. First trimester surgical abortions were the most prevalent abortions. Now over 50% of abortions are done via pill. And this is by design. The abortion industry has been working on this for a long time because it's cheaper for them to do away with brick and mortar and to just mail out pills. And under the Biden administration, some of the Trump era rules, the protect life rule and other rules um, that the FDA had in place to prevent just sending abortion pills via mail have now been removed. So now you can literally click a button and order an abortion pill online, whether you're a 15 year old girl or you're the abuser of a 15-year-old girl and you're trying to have her force an abortion on her, which is what happens to a lot of young girls in this country, and you can just click a button and you can order an abortion pill online. And increasingly, this is the plan for the abortion industry because then they don't even have to deal with the in-clinic experience. 
But abortion pills are some of the most dangerous abortions. There's a 5 to 6% emergency room rate uh, visit for women. There's a, there's a failure rate where often the abortions don't work, or if there's an ectopic pregnancy, that child can't actually be, be delivered, as you know, and that uh, abortion pill, which is supposed to force a miscarriage, ultimately kill the child first, and then a force a miscarriage second, can't d be done properly, so it can be a life-threatening situation for the mom. All of the side effects of the abortion pill, it's killed over 20 women since the FDA fast-tracked its approval under then-President Clinton, who was one of the most pro-abortion presidents that we've had in our history. And it's important to know about it because there is a solution, there's an antidote to it, which I will talk about soon. But this is the plan of the abortion industry. Desensitize people to the value of the human person, push abortion on women as somehow a right and somehow a positive thing, and then make it as accessible and quick and easy as possible. It's a quick fix. We'll just send you a pill in the mail and that will solve your problems. I could go on about other aspects of the culture of death. I know that you're facing mania, some of you, the transgender mania and the, this attack on our children that takes psychological challenges they might be facing or they're dealing with and m says that mutilation or blocking or stunting their growth, stunting puberty is a solution. There's euthanasia. There's recently a case out of Colorado, some of you may have heard about this, about a few girls with severe anorexia who were given as a prescription for their severe anorexia euthanasia, AKA murder them, kill them, because it's, it, they're helpless cases. So the threats are not just threats on children in the womb, it's children outside of the womb, it's those that are suffering psychologically, and it's those that are, el are elderly. Disrespect across the whole spectrum of, of the person's life. But what do we do to respond? How do we respond? It can be so heavy to even consider this. And I want to share some thoughts on how we can do this and what I see the successes that are happening. Because as I said, the frenzy is happening, this frenzy of pro-abortion extremism. But that's because there's a strong light that has been building in the pro-life movement. And a light that is based on this amazing thing that happens, that when people learn, they change. I see it every day. When young people see the humanity of the child in the womb, when they learn the facts about abortion, a light bulb goes off. We get comments every day, this changed my mind on abortion. I was pro-choice, I thought I was in support of it, now I'm pro-life. Because they're simply confronted with a different narrative. They're given the truth. Think about the fact that our education system, most of it, most of our media today, most of our political institutions, even our healthcare institutions are pro-abortion. They teach the culture of death. And yet, despite that, so many are pro-life today. And so many more, about half and half, half of Americans consider themselves pro-life despite the fact that the institutions are teaching abortion, are teaching life as something that is disposable. And it's because the law of truth, God's law, is written in our hearts, deep down in our hearts. We see the humanity of the person, and it sparks something in us. And one of the necessary goals of a culture of life must be to not only make abortion illegal, because we know that human rights have to start with every human's beginning, the moment of fertilization, to not only make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. And so part of our fight is education. It's changing hearts and minds. That's how we build a culture of life, through education as well as through legislation and the service and helping families and the needs that they're facing day in and day out. Another encouraging piece of news to report to you is that in just this year so far, in the last five months, not even yet five months of 2022, we have seen some of the most unprecedented amount of pro-life legislation. In the last two years, it has been the most amount of pro-life legislation in American history that has been passed at the state level. So this is, and we can cheer for that. Just recently, Iowa, uh, I, I, excuse me, Idaho passed a law that criminalizes abortion. Um, Kentucky passed a law that criminalizes abortion, criminalizing the abortionist, so not penalties for the mother, but for the abortionist. Texas's heartbeat bill has been in effect since last fall and has already saved thousands of lives in the great state of Texas. So there is incredible work being done at the state level in anticipation that in the next two months, we will see from a Supreme Court that seems to lean towards respect for our constitution, respect for human life, that we will see a great blow struck to the heart of Roe v. Wade when they uphold Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban, this pre-viability abortion ban. 
This will be a huge step forward for the pro-life movement. I want to leave you with three calls to action for us as we work together to build this culture of life, this culture that protects and respects and, and loves, cherishes every life. First of all, the culture of death needs our silence to survive. It needs especially the silence and the fear of Christians to survive. Some of you know the history of Christian medicine and the fact that Christian medicine is actually medicine that view of the human person, the child, the vulnerable, as being equal in dignity is essential to medicine that respects human rights. And that's a view that's a Christian view that came from what Jesus Christ taught us in radically valuing the human person that didn't exist in the Roman Empire, that didn't exist before Christ came. And when he came, things changed in a beautiful way in Western civilization. And now we, now we have this, at least this hope for a culture of life where every life is respected. And so the culture of death needs Christians, especially, especially in the medical profession, to be silent, to be sort of embarrassed by our values, our morals, our ethics. And yet when we have the courage to speak the truth, it changes everything. It emboldens others. It gives others the courage to also speak the truth that they know is true because it's written in the heart. It's written in our hearts. So I want to encourage you to speak the truth boldly. I understand there's many attacks against healthcare professionals, against conscience protections for healthcare professionals. But the more we are silent, the more we give them space to attack. And so to be willing to speak that truth whenever the opportunity is there. And here's a very concrete way. Abortion pill reversal is a new technology that uses very tried and true uh, FDA-approved progesterone to counteract the toxicity, ultimately, of the first abortion pill. So the first abortion pill, there's a, a pill regimen. The first one ultimately starves a child. And so the progesterone is there to counteract that, to prevent the child from dying. Women, many who take the first abortion pill, feel regret. They're all of a sudden worried. Why did I do this? What do I do now? Uh, I, I don't want this abortion anymore. And they feel that they have to go through with the second pill, which forces the miscarriage. But if every medical professional in this country, especially those that are Christian, posted abortion pill reversal resources on the wall of their office so women even know that this technology exists, it would save thousands and potentially in long run millions of lives. So CMDA is partnering with some other great pro-life groups, including Live Action, to help make this technology and learning about the technology, which is developed by doctors and medical professionals, accessible to every medical professional in the country. So that's a very concrete action item in sharing the truth to, to allow your patients, even if it's a dentist office, to allow your patients to know that this technology exists because it is literally life versus death. And this technology has already saved over 3,000 lives since it was introduced several years back. And it's just getting started. It has a 64 to 68% success rate already in counteracting that first abortion pill. So it's a very powerful technology. So the first one is speak the truth boldly, share the truth boldly. The second, we have to refuse to compromise with a culture of death. No compromises. They will say, oh, abortion is necessary, and just in the first trimester, we should permit it. Or, oh, abortion is sometimes medically necessary. No. Dublin Declaration, over 1,000 medical professionals have said, no, you can care for them both. Sometimes an early delivery may be necessary, but the direct and intentional killing of an unborn child is never medically necessary. It is not a medical treatment to never compromise, whether it's on the issue of euthanasia, uh, the transgender craze that's happening in our country right now, whether it's on reproductive assisted technologies that violate the dignity of, of human life, whether it's abortion, that we as Christian professionals and you as Christian healthcare professionals never compromise the truth as you know and encourage others to stand strong. I have heard horror stories of Christians in the pews, Christians in our church who have compromised. The baby had a health defect. The pastor gave us permission to have the abortion. Less suffering for the baby. No, torturous suffering for the baby. And instead of knowing the love of their mother's arms for maybe the few hours of life they had, they knew the torture of an abortionist's tools. We have to be passionate about not compromising as Christians because Satan would want us to compromise even in the smallest ways to hurt our witness and to hurt the future of our country, the hope that we have for a culture of life. And then the last thing, it's hope. We should boldly hope. 
it is dark out there. I mean, it can be overwhelming sometimes when you're in and day out reading news of reports from the culture of death. But we have hope in Jesus Christ who is king. Jesus Christ who is king, Lord of all, Lord of this country. And we can change this culture. When people learn, they change. I've seen it myself. I've seen pro-choice people become pro-life. I've seen people convert. I myself, daily conversion to try to align my heart to Christ. We can change. And we must have hope that we can change. And not just that we can change in our daily conversions, but that others can change too. Never give up on anybody. Never give up on even the hardest, hardest case. Some of my favorite interviews in my time as an investigative journalist has been interviewing former abortionists who have committed sometimes thousands and thousands of abortions who talk about how now they are passionately pro-life. Anybody can change. So let us get to work together in building that culture of life with the hope that we have from Christ. Thank you all so much. What a powerful challenge from Lila for us as Christians to stand strong and to not stay silent. I hope you were challenged just like I was. And during her talk, you heard Lila share about the Abortion Pill Reversal Network. If you want more information about that resource, visit abortionpillreversal.com. You can also find more about the work of Live Action at liveaction.org. At the beginning of her talk, Lila said, when people learn, they change. As Christians in healthcare, we can help people learn so that they can change their views on abortion and protect the lives of the most vulnerable among us. And one of those ways you can do that is by taking advantage of some of the resources available through CMDA. First, you can earn continuing education credit by studying our ethics statements on abortion in the CMDA Learning Center at cmda.org learning. Next, you can find two books written by a couple of our fellow CMDA members in our bookstore on this topic. First is Supremely Wrong, The Injustice of Abortion by Dr. Brent Bowles. In his book, Dr. Bowles provides an insider's survey of the issues at stake, from helping his patients left mistreated by the abortion industry, to testifying before state legislators, and to firsthand accounts from his work as an OBGYN, the book reveals injustice at large in America. The second book is Unexpected Choice, An Abortion Doctor's Journey to Pro-Life by Dr. Patty Giebink, who was our guest on CMDA Matters last year. In this book, Dr. Giebink shares her emotional journey of turning away from being an abortion doctor and becoming a pro-life advocate. You can find these two books and more in the CMDA Bookstore at cmda.org slash bookstore. The topic of abortion continues to come up in the public square on a daily basis. So if God is calling you to get more involved in this pro-life fight against abortion, please reach out to CMDA's Advocacy and Communications Department at communications at cmda.org. You can also check out the CMDA Learning Center, which is filled with additional opportunities for you to learn about today's bioethical issues. Designed to advance your knowledge in key areas of healthcare today, Our educational content is a trusted source of education for thousands of healthcare professionals, and it's free for our CMDA members. Just visit the Learning Center at cmda.org slash learning. Speaking of the Learning Center, you'll be able to find the breakout sessions from the recent convention in the Learning Center coming soon. So be on the lookout for those in the coming weeks. CMDA is partnering with the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary to host an in-person conference called Critical Conversations on Identity and Gender. Medical and pastoral care face a daunting task in the midst of a discussion about transgenderism and choices about sexual preference, especially when theological reflections on how we are made are deliberately left to the side. As Christians, how do we speak effectively, truthfully, and graciously while giving care in such an environment? Please join us for this critical conversation as we consider the theology, science, legal counsel, 
and pastoral care required to serve people well as individual caregivers and as fellow members of society. You can join us live in Dallas, Texas, or virtually on August 5 through 6. Registration is now available at cmda.org events. If you've been inspired by Lila's talk, then let me encourage you to register now for the 2023 CMDA National Convention, which will be in Cincinnati, Ohio on April 27th through 30th, 2023. Registration is now open, and just for our podcast listeners, you can use the promo code PODCAST for $25 off your registration fees. Visit natcon.cmda.org today to register. Next week, I'll be back with another recording from the 2022 CMDA National Convention. If you missed it, now's your chance to listen. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest for the podcast, you can email us your recommendation at cmdamatters at cmda.org. And if you like the podcast, be sure to give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform. I hope and pray that today's episode with Lila Rose motivated you to stand strong in your faith and your convictions in healthcare. The community you have through CMDA is a vast resource that will undoubtedly help you to do just that. This is a recent comment from a medical student as an example. The biggest takeaway from the convention is the amount of support that the members of CMDA have for each other, especially for us as students. I was welcomed, prayed for, and had meals bought for me by multiple people. CMDA is also willing to talk about the controversial issues, speak truth, which I think a lot of people are looking for nowadays. Thank you for being a member of CMDA and thank you for standing strong and speaking up. Because by doing so, you are bringing the hope and healing of Christ to the world. That's what matters to CMDA and CMDA matters. God bless. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.